Hello, I'm Natalio, and I am back to make a second video, so welcome. I was really happy, excited, overwhelmed, inspired by all of the responses that my Crazy Women and Jordan Peterson video received, and it made me feel like these conversations about the nature of males, the nature of females, human nature, and sexual dynamics are really important to have. It seems like a lot of men and a lot of women are in pain when it comes to the opposite sex. And I don't have all of the answers to fix that. You know, some people commented, well, you didn't tell us how to fix or deal with crazy women. And I thought that was a pretty bold expectation to have of me. Um, there's a lot of factors that affect how well a person is doing emotionally, mentally, physically, and that's a huge topic. So today I'd like to continue talking about females, males, and human evolution because I think through understanding our nature and um, you know the nature of the opposite sex, we can bring more compassion and understanding to our lives and to our relationships. And you know, some of you complimented me on giving an emotion-free presentation, and I think that's important when I'm offering scientific um, knowledge, but I do have emotions and passions when it comes to this kind of material. You know, it's really important, and it's such a timely topic. Um, so I, you know, I promise to you that I will do my best to let you know when I'm telling you, you know, scientific facts, versus when I'm speculating or extrapolating or when I'm telling you my opinion. And you know that might be important for when I share some thoughts on astrology with all of you because yes, I am a PhD student. I study evolutionary biology. I teach personality and evolutionary psychology um, as a grad student. And I'm also practicing and studying astrologer. And I've you know, even been I've had a professor refuse to work with me because I study astrology and he just thought that was insane that anyone who did science could study astrology. So maybe I'll shed some light on that another time. But for today, I want to keep talking about um, females, males, sex, and evolution because the more you know, right? <laughs> so the specific topic today is sexual antagonism. I'm going to tell you what that is, and then I'm going to share with you how these dynamics of sexual antagonism, also called sexual conflict, can shape patterns of health and disease in humans, how these processes can generate novel and interesting traits in a population, and how they also help explain or give some shape to this idea of um, tension and drama and conflict between the sexes you know it's like this eternal um or like you know ancient like it, it's always been there that males and females have always had this like struggle with one another and you know maybe some of that is because of this process i'm going to talk to you about so sexual antagonism occurs when you have a trait that shows up in both sexes that has the same or similar genetic basis uh, between the two sexes. But if the trait, say, is highly expressed in males, it gives the male good reproductive success. But if the same trait is highly expressed in females, it gives them poor reproductive success. So the same trait, different levels of expression, um, create different fitness outcomes for the sexes. So an example of this, um, a simple one would be height. Taller males tend to have higher reproductive success. Shorter females have better reproductive success. But height is shaped by the same genes in men and women. So what happens is that neither sex can achieve its uh, ideal expression of that trait. There is a constraint because the sexes share genes that give rise to shared traits, but there's opposite patterns 
of selection going on in that trait, depending on if it's a male or a female body. And sexual conflict can eventually um, you know, push evolution towards sexual dimorphism, where you have an, an uncoupling of trait expression between the sexes. Um, but sometimes that's not possible, and then every generation you get traits that aren't ideal, and sometimes for the sexes. And uh, sometimes this manifests as um, deviations from health or disease. So let's see, what's the first example? Well, the kind of the biggest body of research that helped us understand sexual conflict happened in fruit flies, of course, because fruit flies you can breed very quickly and you can see what's happening. You know, can't really ethically do that with humans. But male fruit flies have something called accessory glands that uh, create chemicals that enter the sperm, or that enter the semen, but they're not sperm, it's chemicals in addition to the sperm. And these chemicals um, influence female physiology and behavior. So for example, um, these chemicals released by male fly accessory glands might increase the female egg laying rate. And it might increase the female egg laying rate to a point that is detrimental to female reproductive success. You know, if laying more eggs is uh, too costly for the female. So what that, happen what that does is create an evolutionary pressure on the female to um, respond. You know, she evolves something that can either like break down those chemicals um, or something like that. And we have a homologous, homologous isn't the right word there, um, an analogous um, situation going on in humans. So male humans have a prostate gland. The prostate gland doesn't make sperm, but it makes other uh, fluids that add to the semen that impact the success of the sperm um, in reproduction. And um, one important gene, so the androgen receptor, which is responsible in part for activating the effects of testosterone in the body. And this receptor shows up in both male and female bodies. And um, different kinds of androgen receptor genes give rise to different health and fertility effects in the sexes. So if a male has fewer repeats of the CAG microsatellite, he tends to have higher fertility, but also higher risk of prostate cancer. If a female has uh, that same uh, genetic variant, so fewer repeats, relatively fewer repeats of the CAG microsatellite, uh, she tends to have a higher risk of breast cancer. So that's one example of how sexual conflict can shape health and disease. And another one comes from the mental health literature, which is really interesting. Um, you know, some of the psychological uh, diagnoses provide a bit of a paradox to us people who study evolution. And this is one of my main areas, is understanding evolutionary dynamics that shape patterns of personality and uh, mental illness. So if a mental illness is predictive of reduced reproduction, you know, why does that mental illness persist through time? You know, if people with severe schizophrenia are not having very many children, which is, that's exactly what the data shows, why do we get schizophrenia in every generation? Why wouldn't evolution uh, remove it from the genome? Why isn't it selected against? Well, um, some research suggests that this could partially be due to the effects of sexual conflict. So with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, um, what some data has shown is that if you have, um, I say a man with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, or many men, and you examine their families, specifically their female relatives, those female relatives tend to have significantly more offspring um, than families that don't have schizophrenia in them. So female relatives of males with schizophrenia have significantly more offspring than female relatives of males without schizophrenia. So, um, you know, even though there's many genes that impact schizophrenia, you know, and many of them show up in people without schizophrenia, but this shows um, because, you know, males and females of the same family share genes with one another, it suggests that those genes that give rise to schizophrenia in a male somehow increase the reproductive output um, in a female body.
And the second interesting point to me about sexual conflict is that it can give rise uh, to really novel and interesting traits in a population. And there's an, an example in humans of this that's relatively new. And, you know, maybe you'll find this as interesting as me. So following the same logic of these paradoxes, you know, if this trait reduces reproductive output, why does it persist in a population? That paradox can be applied to homosexuality. We know, I'm going to talk about uh, male homosexuality. We know that gay men tend to have fewer offspring than straight men. Of course, they're capable of reproducing, um, but data shows gay men have fewer children than straight men. You know, we know that male homosexuality shows up around the world in a relatively um, consistent prevalence, you know, suggestive of some um, genetic effects. So why hasn't selection removed male homosexuality? Why would evolution create men who aren't reproducing? You know, and some people, uh, you know, come up with these explanations like, oh, it's nature's way of preventing overpopulation, but that's not how it works. However, sexual conflict seems to be a very possible avenue for maintaining um, male homosexuality in the genome. And this follows the same patterns as some of the findings from the schizophrenia literature, such that female relatives, so mothers, aunts, cousins, sisters of gay males tend to have more offspring and significantly fewer reproductive disorders such as endometriosis or polycystic ovary syndrome, you know, that negatively impact fertility. So female relatives of gay males have healthier reproductive systems and have more children than female relatives of straight males. And that explains why, or at least it, you know, can in part help us understand and, and explain why male homosexuality persists from generation to generation. Because the genes that give rise to homosexuality in a male give rise to superior reproductive capacity in female bodies. You know, and the third and final point I wanted to make here is how sexual conflict, you know, it kind of suggests, it suggests this uh, tension between the sexes. So, you know, one sex evolves something that increases its reproduction, but it creates a cost to the other sex. And that sex has to create something to counter it. And then you get this back and forth, really dynamic relationship, because it's not like a solution can ever emerge through time. There's not like the one perfect trait that will solve the puzzle, because you have two agents involved with different reproductive strategies or different pathways to their reproductive success. And then you have this constraint on perfection if we consider perfection in terms of you know reproductive fitness which is a narrow way of looking at it but this idea is floating around in my head somewhere um i'm not sure where it's from but this idea that you know humans i'm speaking in a more like mythological sense so set the science aside for a moment um this idea that humans as a species you know, are, are imperfect um and that maybe you know at one point um, you know, in certain like creation or origin stories, um, you know, we were one perfect being with all the male and all the female parts, and now we've been split into two. And I thought this idea was so interesting when I related it to sexual conflict, because it's true, you know, we cannot achieve perfect health um, because we're constrained through this process of sexual conflict. So... Maybe you find, find this as interesting as I do, um, and maybe you can extrapolate or speculate on how some of these dynamics of sexual conflict might, uh, you know, give rise to different kinds of uh, social and cultural institutions. And even though social and cult cultural institutions don't have a genetic basis, so it's not necessarily the same mechanism, but I think of it as just this theme <clears throat> where you have, you know, um, one sex... Uh, with a certain trait or behavior that benefits itself that creates a cost to the other sex. And so, you know, you might think of different kinds of social or cultural institutions that have different effects on male and female health and male and female reproduction. 
So I sometimes think about monogamous marriage in this context and or maybe uh, education, you know. And again, I'm not saying that these uh, institutions are working in the same uh, working with the same process as evolution because um, they're not genetically passed on. But I like to apply that line of thinking to kind of creatively analyze um, institutions like that. So for example, you know, with marriage, we can just think like, and it depends on the kind of marriage, but who uh, does a monogamous marriage benefit more? A male or a female? I mean, it depends for sure. But, you know, some people could argue, um, you know, enforced monogamy can potentially give, you know, um, every man a female partner where maybe they wouldn't have had a female partner if there were, like, um, certain highly competitive males accruing many mates. Um, that might mean that some females end up with a mate that's relatively... Um, lower genetic quality than she might prefer. Um, it can a marriage can increase um, certainty of paternity for a male. Um, a marriage can give you know a female consistent access to resources. So I don't know. What do you think? Sexual conflict, sexual antagonism. Um, you know, from what I've said today, it creates uh, you know gives rise to this constant tension between the sexes that can never be resolved. It consistently gives rise to disease or deviations from health, and it can also create, you know, really interesting um, sets of traits, such as, you know, homosexuality in males. So tell me what you think, and have a great day.